Right, thank you, everybody. I will speak, uh, stick to 15 minutes if we can start. Right, good. Um, I only want to talk about one thing, and that is that uh, this year there are over a million children entering grade R. Um, in 13 years' time, fewer than 500,000 will complete school, and of those, about 200,000 will fail. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do over the next 12 years to make sure that the prospects of the children who are dropping out of school, who are failing, is substantially better. And you know which children are, are failing. It's the poorest children. That's what we have to be talking about today. So let me start. I'm, I want to talk to you about the distribution of quality in South African schools. It looks like a talk, tortoise. It walks like a tortoise. Maybe, maybe over the last 20 years, and here I'm showing you the proportion of schools against the quality of education. So the schools on the right um, are higher quality, schools on the left are lower quality. This is the proportion of, of schools. I can go into the academic slides behind it. I just want to give you the brush strokes here. Um, we have an 80-20 situation where 80% of our schools are underperforming. Then there's a dip. 20% of schools are performing well. If you're generous, you can say that there's been some uh, improvement in quality since 1994. Let's not bother about arguing that. The point is that the distribution of the quality in South Africa has not changed over the last decade, uh, two decades. And if you map the quintiles of school, almost exactly, not entirely, but almost exactly, that's what it looks like. Quintile 1 schools are falling here. Quintile 5 schools are, are falling there. In 2015, quintile 1 and 2 schools, in terms of matric pass rates, were 50 times more likely to underperform if underperformance is achievement of pass rates less than 40% compared to quintile 5 schools. And I just want to say that cherry picking of the best students, putting them into private schools, putting them into former Model C schools, class hopping of a few children is simply not going to change. It cannot be the basis of redistribution in South Africa. That's, that's not what's going to change it. And I also want to say that the market is not going to get to the poorest 50% of schools. And we, we hear about low fee independent schools. No. Those are not low fee independent schools when you look at, um, at the 60% of our population um, who um, absolutely have to have publicly fun funded um, options uh, for schooling. Um, and, and what I want to say is that the rising tide is not going to lift all boats. If we have an approach in South Africa that says there needs to be systems-wide improvement, um, of course we need that. Of course that tortoise needs to become a hare and move across fast uh, to the left. But on its own, on its own, systems-wide improvement actually favor the wealthiest kids the most. We've seen it with grade R, uh, where the introduction of grade R um, actually differentially privileged uh, children in, in, in quintile five and showed virtually no improvement in quintile one. The only way that we are going to change this, this shape, this, this tortoise shape, is if there is an intense and sustained national program that's focused on the underperforming schools serving the poorest communities. There is no other way. Yes, it's got to be supported by, uh, by broad brush systemic development, but that is not enough. That is not enough to change the profile of quality in South Africa. If we don't do that in South Africa, this is what 2030 will look like. One in two children entering grade R now will have dropped out. The quality curve will have widened and become even more divided. The independent sector will break free and will get much larger. Fee differentials, prices um, at, the, at, at the, the, the higher end, will, the, those differentials will be much higher than they are today. Public schools will be viewed as places where poor kids go to, and in times of uh, financial pressure, those subsidies that are delivered to independent schools will be taken away. How do I know this? Why am I saying it? Well, it's happened in the health sector. 
We saw it 20 years ago. I was part of helping to set up the health sector. We made the same mistakes that, that, that the education system makes now if we don't think differently about this. We cannot imagine that, that simple regulation, simple licensing of the private sector is, 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 is going to be enough to, to contain the private sector if it's not located within a spectrum of schooling that is disproportionately focused uh, uh, on the quintile one and two um, schools in our country. Now, I do think, um, and, and I suspect that this is where we're going to start differ a little bit with uh, amongst ourselves and how we do that. I think that there are essentially three strategies that we can use to begin to change the shape of the quality curve. I think that the, the so-called low-fee independent schools may well help to lessen the, the depth of the valley between quintile three and a half and quintile five uh, schools. I, I do think there's, that there's the potential that, that they can do that. Um, but I don't think, as I've said before, that I don't think that they really have any role, certainly for the poorest 50% of, of, of children, and I'm happy to debate that with Chris. Certainly, doing what we're doing in, in underperforming public schools, finding ways to strengthen those public schools with an intense focus um, could start to move a, a proportion of the schools out, uh, uh, out of the, the lowest quality area. And, and note that because we have a distribution that is so skewed to low uh, 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 quality, we might, in fact, we might in fact find a tipping point because even a move of, say, 10 or, or, or 15 percent of these schools out of the poorest may in fact help us uh, to have a virtuous cycle of improving the quality. Um, but what I also want to say is that where there are underperforming schools that have been consistently underperforming for 10 years or 15 years, it's not enough to simply say the system is going to ultimately change them. It's not enough for those kids entering grade R now. We have to take those underperforming schools and place them under new management whether that's new management that is principles from other schools within the public sector or find a different way of doing it. And that's what I'm, I would like to talk to, uh, to you about. Now, why do poor schools produce poor results? Again, there's a, there's a wealth of evidence behind it, but, but basically three, three reasons. Firstly, poorer kids come into the school less able to learn. Okay. Less, less able to learn. I'm happy to discuss the basis of, it, of that, but that is the reality. And teachers will, tell you, teachers will tell you that they battle to overcome the massive learning deficits, deficits because children have not had the proper early language development, the proper early learning exposure that wealthier kids have. Secondly, poorer schools often don't have the diversity of social capital that wealthier schools do. Of course, they're drawing on the strength of community assets, but often they don't have access to the resources, to the money, to the professional core that a lot of the wealthier sc schools have. We've, we've heard that former Model C schools actually only, uh, only obtain maybe one-tenth of their money from the state. The rest is either through school fees or tapping into this massive social capital that these marginalized schools don't. The, the third is that in, in these poorer schools, and, and, and uh, I've cited some of the sources, the, the, the culture of teacher development and good management is not as entrenched as, as, uh, as some of the uh, quintile five schools. There are, of course, extraordinary schools, and the extraordinary schools are not the Westerfords and those schools. It's schools in the townships and deep rural areas that are doing extraordinary things, but they are extraordinary. They are, they are in the, not by any chance are they anywhere near the majority of schools. In a lot of those, in a lot of the schools, cultures of good management of teacher development are not in place. And in a situation like that, bureaucratic rigidity sets in. Administrative compliance becomes the, the dominant way of teaching. Um, the, the lack, the, the rigidity of the system is disproportionately is a disproportionate uh, burden on the poorest schools as well. Now, some may say, well, we've got a pro-poor approach to funding in South Africa. Maybe, maybe not. I suspect 
In most cases, not. And I just, here, yeah, this is purely illustrative, so please don't quote this as a source. But I'm just, I'm giving two examples where you've got a quintile five school that's got a mature teacher base, been around for a long time, on, um, on higher salary notches. The salary bill is where most of the money goes to in schools. The norms and standards component, where, there is a, where there's differentiation towards the poorer schools, is a tiny proportion. It's 1,300, 1,285 now for quintile one and two, and 215 or so for, for welter schools. But that's, that is, 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 is um, small compared to the, uh, the per capita expenditure of maybe 14, uh, 15,000 schools. So we don't have a pro-poor financing strategy, I don't think. Some, somebody might correct me, but I don't think we have that in, that, that, uh, that in place in South Africa. Where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to get the money for this intensive focus that I'm talking about in quintile one and two? Neither has targeted donor funding been able to make a difference. We haven't budged the, uh, the, the, the tortoise. Now, donor funding is about four billion rand uh, annually, um, which you say, well, that's tiny compared to 250 billion rand basic education uh, uh, budget. But when you look at the dis discretional part of the basic education uh, budget, that not for teachers, that not for books, it's actually so 4 billion rand could well be an important point of leverage, but it hasn't worked properly. Um, and one of the reasons, somebody alluded earlier to the importance of two-way accountability. Funders come in, often they're not accountable to the school, um, and, uh, and, and nobody's accountable for the way that money is spent. So a lot of money gets wasted. And, and, and it's important to understand, thank you, it's important to understand that there is um, a potential uh, source of funding, the socioeconomic development funding, um, that, that's uh, part of statutory obligations of government, that could be directed if there was proper accountability, if there were good systems of monitoring. We haven't got it right, but it is a potential additional source of revenue that could be directed to the poorest quintile one and two schools. So, what are public school partnerships? What are collaboration schools? What are we trying to do? We're trying to create a new major opportunity for quality education for poor children in South Africa. And our idea is that if, if we can get 10 or 15% of public schools, public schools, serving the poorest 40% of children placed under new management in networks of schools that are characterized by high capacity, high flexibility on how you spend your budget, who you hire, um, and, and in return, outcomes-based accountability, accountable to, uh, for ensuring that children perform better. That's the quid pro quo with government. If one, if one can achieve that, um, we believe that we can open up a new branch of public schooling. What does this mean under new management? Well, funding, state guarantees the same amount of funding as any other public school. Um, there's performance-based contracting, um, and now, uh, and, and this is where it starts to get a, a little bit tricky and interesting. Um, the, there's a school operating partner who has either a majority or 50-50 say on the school governing body. Okay. So, so actually plays a governance role on the school governing body. Managed by the school operating partner with discretion over staff, budget, and curriculum. Part of a wider network so that, so that teachers can learn from each other. And that school gets then linked into local and regional networks. Now, what makes this different? Well, the positioning is that this is about non-profit, non-profit operating partners, non-profit operating partners operating in a non-selective way, so they don't cherry pick which, uh, which children come in, um, in no fee paying schools. Embedded within, the, the, uh, it, with, it, within a national system in which there is public financing, public accountability, part of the public system, but non-profit operators who are currently providing support outside of the system into the public schools, but without any sort of accountability, can now be truly accountable. The donor funding to the school is limited because this is not just about trying to come up with fantastic Rolls-Royce schools trying to find a way that we achieve um, sustainability over time by building social capital, by declining premium that comes from donor funds, and hopefully in time starting to tap into the type of other sources of funding that I've spoken about. 
Now, those of you who've heard about collaboration schools will know that some of the criticism is that it's a Trojan horse for privatization. And of course, there's a risk. Um, there's always a risk when you're trying something new that the idea gets hijacked by somebody else. And we have to be alert to the risk. But that can't prevent us from bold steps to try and do something for children in South Africa. Some people say this is about commercialization. commercialization. Well, these are non-profit operators. If government changes and said they can be for-profit operators, I'd have to back off. I'd, I would say that, that's, that that would be um, a distortion of what we're trying to achieve. Some people say parents are disempowered. Well, parents choose for the school to opt in and opt out. They choose um, the type of governance structure. Um, and those of you who have been part of this process will know the intense process of engagement with parents where they come to the point and say, we want quality education, but we're giving you, we're holding you on a short leash. We're not giving you carte blanche to do anything you like in our schools. We are going to, we expect reporting on an annual basis from you and we will kick you out if you don't, if you don't agree. Um, sorry, if you don't perform. A, a third is that teachers' employment is casualized. Well, the interesting thing about this is that the state guarantees the same amount to the, to, to the teacher as, as they would to a publicly employed teacher. Long-term sustainability? Well, we're not sure. Can this be done over the long term? Not sure. That's what we're testing. That's what the pilot is about over the next five years. Um, and, and another criticism is that this is outsourcing education. Well, what we're trying to do is bring non-profit expertise into the public system and find a more logical continuum between public and private provision in South Africa. What it requires the education system to do, which I think uh, has happened in the social development sector, in the health sector, is a clear differentiation between public financing and provision. And the precedents in South Africa have been set for the separation. Trade unions are supportive of the national health insurance in South Africa. What is the national health insurance if it is not a separation of, of public financing from who provides it? And NHI proposes that, that for-profit commercial providers should be included as well. So, so I, I, I find it hard to understand the, the ideological objection um, from, from uh, trade unions when it's accepted in the NHI. As we've heard earlier, the state subsidizes low-fee independent schools um, up to 60% of capita. Why? Why fund independent schools up to 60%? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense um, unless, unless that particular strategy is located in a much more coherent strategy, a much more uh, logical realignment of the, uh, of the government sector. And this is what I, uh, uh, what I propose is that if the state whose mandate is to ensure the provision of basic education, if that's, if that's their role, and if they are ensuring that provision either through direct provision or through providing funding and, and subsidies, that must be part of the, the government system. That must be part of the government system. We, have to, we, we can't simply be saying independent schools report to government. Because, as I said, when push comes to shove in 10 years' time, when there's a financial crisis, um, the first people to lose out in the f will, will be children in, in, uh, in subsidized independent schools. We've seen it already in, uh, in, in KZN. We have to ensure that it's properly located in a, in a policy framework. Thank you very much for your time.